my dad wrote in his journal. The Indian summer temperature had made the thermometer climb up over 90 degrees. After over two hours under the laser light of my dentist, I groggily left the office with a swollen cheek and slowly made my way back down to my studio a few blocks away. And while I was making up my mind, rather to cancel my next appointment, this dazzling teenager with this voluptuous figure wiggled by. <laughs> she had curves in all the right places. And she moved with the unadulterated movements of a strip tease artist, Lily St. Cyr, Tempest Storm. And when they were stripping, you know, down on the stage of the Burbank Theater on Main Street, could this be the nymphette hooker? True, it was wartime and the oldest profession was thriving, but child prostitution in a nice neighborhood? I found my arm waving and my mouth whistling the lovely, to the lovely vision. Uh, yeah, anyway, I, I whistled her to a halt. A rather rude method, I must admit. But I gave her my card and I said, uh, <clears throat> it's purely professional, but I, 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 <clears throat> I, like, I, like, I want to take some shots. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I was just looking at those two, you yeah. <laughs> know? At 6 a.m. sharp, Norma Jean's black Ford jalopy screeched to a halt outside of 9055 Sunset Boulevard. Norma Jean stood in front of the studio, overwhelmed with wishes and expectations. She stared up at Dad's inviting Bernard of Hollywood signature above a life-size photo of Gregory Peck. The Gee. air was swept clean. Gee, do you really think I can make it as a cover model, Mr. Bernard? Darling, my camera never lies. She started to confide in me, especially after I told her that I too was brought up in an orphanage. She became my little sis, and I promised to help her all I could, which, which I did. She told me, I never really lived with my mother. I, I had, let's say, 10 or 11 foster families. She was put in a crazy house in Norwalk. You ever been to Norwalk, Mr. Bernard? I was, I was told she had a paran paranoid schizo schizophrenia. My grandmother and grandfather, well, they died in one of those crazy places. I, I don't know when she went away. But I have dreams of her pushing me in a baby carriage and I'm wearing this pretty white dress. Oh, uh, what about your father, Norma Jean? On the weekends, sometimes the foster families, they would sit me in a movie theater from morning to night and I'd watch Clark Gable and I'd pretend he was my father. My mother's not dead, I remember screaming. I have a mother. Then after a while, in the orphanage, I'd pretend she was dead. I cleaned toilets, and I worked in the kitchen, washing dishes. There were a hundred of us. We made five cents a month. At night, when everyone was sleeping, I'd sit up in the window and cry. I'd look over in the distance. And there was this tall water tower, and on top of it, it said, RKO. And my mother had worked as a cutter at RKO. Hmm. I can't see her face, but she was a woman with red hair. Without warning, a social worker <clears throat> sent my brother Heinz, and my sister Gerda, and, uh, and me to three different orphanages. So, because of this pitiful way that we lived, you know, it's, it's a great shame in a Jewish family. You had a family, Mr. Bernard. The world is your oyster, Norma Jean. I was alone and penniless when I kissed the ground on Ellis Island. We are survivors, you and I. My dad wrote in his journal. This real life Cinderella story transported me back to the newspaper and scrap metal route to my childhood in Berlin. It released my empathy for this girl, born on the wrong side of the tracks, who seemed hell-bent on making the American dream come true for herself. 
Norma Jean told Dad. I want to become a movie star. It's, it's been my dream since I was a kid. You've got to take some more sexy photos for me. <laughs> oh, okay, Norma. <clears throat> Darling, whatever you do, never put hot on top of hot. Okay, that, that, that looks vulgar, all right? It would, it would turn a real man off. Let your curves tell it all. Counteract the body language with a look of complete innocence. Your eyes should be asking, why do men look at me? <laughs> <laughs> Blend waif with Venus, and you'll create combustion in the photographs. On the back of the, his photo, my dad wrote, this pinup photo, together with my girl next door photos, got Marilyn her first motion picture contract with Fox. On the photo sleeve, my dad wrote, This was on the cover of Laugh, which got Howard Hughes interested in Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn once said, Someday, I'm going to have oodles and oodles of fan mail, just like Betty Grable. I thought this quote of Marilyn was very moving. When I was eight, I used to look at the orphan asylum's window at night, and I'd see a big lighted up sign that read RKO pictures. There must be a thousand girls sitting alone like me dreaming of becoming a movie star. But I'm not going to worry about them. I'm dreaming the hardest. Uh, chapter three. Marilyn and Johnny, 1949 to 1950. The mornings came with tears on pillows, fears, and collective portrayals. Being dropped by Fox and the six-month Columbia studio buildup coming to a halt was the least of it. <clears throat> Marilyn held her breath, waited for a revelation, wished on a star, pounded the streets, and exhausted her modeling agency. She showed up at Dad's studio looking for a break, an assignment, some indication. Chance and timing had been their destiny. Dad had been commissioned to do a cover layout story at his home away from home, the Palm Springs Racquet Club, a destination for disappearance. It was in Palm Springs one auspicious morning that Marilyn, smell, smelling like baby powder, was unloaded along with the camera equipment from Dad's station wagon. This magical photo safari would change the course of her life forever. When Dad introduced her to Johnny Hyde, vice president of the William Morris Agency, who fell head over heels for her. Who's this gorgeous dame? Your girlfriend? I knew at that instant that could only have been Johnny Hyde, a vice president at William Morris, a shrimp in stature, but long in connections. <laughs> Felt a little annoyed at what he was implying. I, I trust you don't mind if I uh, take a few snapshots strictly for private use? <clears throat> Dad wrote in his journal. Without waiting for an answer to his rhetorical question, Johnny made a <laughs> quick dash back to his bungalow adjacent to the pool, and he stormed out, armed with a Leica, several telephoto lenses. To the amusement of all the bystanders, the former circus acrobat trained, turned agent crouched on his belly, and he fired away from his frog perspective as if Eastman Kodak would go out of business tomorrow. And after he had shot his bolt of 36 exposures, he ran back to his bungalow for more ammunition. This interlude prompted Marilyn to ask, Who's this jerk snapping all these pictures? <laughs> this jerk is Johnny Hyde. He's an ardent amateur photographer. Professionally, he happens to be vice president of the William Morris Agency, so on. I whispered in her here after this input, no, after this input, I might as well have just packed up my camera gear. Her goal was to be a movie star, she told Dad. It was not the money. She turned down money from Johnny. Marilyn called Dad crying. He's got all these tubes running through him, and they've got him under a big oxygen tent. 
Who? Who? Marilyn who? It's Johnny. He had a heart attack at Palm Springs. Oh, okay, Marilyn, listen to me carefully, okay? You're, you're not in a state to drive right now. If anything happens to Johnny, I, I can't go on without him. My dad wrote in his journal. The unstoppable Johnny obtained a copy of the uncut scenes from the asphalt jungle. He made a rough cut for himself. And he projected it for his pal Joe Schenk in his penthouse. Within days of having a massive heart attack and dying, Johnny negotiated a seven-year contract for Marilyn with Fox. Chapter 4, 1951-1953. Marilyn learned to wear mink and white fox, make her eyes the color of dumb blonde, a sad baby blue, be liquid and pour herself into gowns, sip champagne and walk. She learned to realize the extent of her fame and laugh, spring into cars and limos, hide in doorways, not talk to strangers. Strangers were unpredictable. They asked for an autograph, a favor, a photo, wrote letters, proposing marriage, and sent pubic hair. <laughs> she unabashedly threw herself into the consensuality of her body, took pleasure in men desiring her. It amused and excited her. If men in trucks whistled at her, shouting, hey Marilyn, we love you. It was fine, just like when she was Norma Jean, the teenager smiling and giggling when dad whistled to catch her attention. She was well aware of the power she had over others. She needed the proof of being loved. It temporarily erased her fears of being unwanted. Being loved by her public saved her. In Hollywood, there is the story, and then there are the facts. At least that's what famous band leader Ray Anthony implied when I interviewed him over the phone and asked, could you tell me about the party when Marilyn wore her pink dress from Niagara and Mickey Rooney was there? Susan, do you want the story or do you want the facts? Oh, Ray, I want what really happened. No, I threw a a party at my house for Marilyn. It was a big publicity party. Fox and my publicist read Doff through in 1952. I wrote a song, Marilyn. She was very gracious and, and took pictures with everyone. There was this uh, helicopter and Look Magazine was gonna cover it from the sky. There was a downdraft and the helicopter started falling. Luckily, uh, there was a big open space at my home and the helicopter could safely land. People said it was a publicity stunt, but it wasn't. There were international photographers, 500 people at the party, and the press started shooting pictures of Marilyn and me and the Navy helicopter guy. There was traffic held up on Ventura Boulevard for hours. Huh. What about Mickey Rooney, I asked. Ah, Mickey showed up at every party. <laughs> <laughs> I heard, Ray, that Marilyn arrived in the helicopter. Not true. 